Hello, everyone. So Wayne and I, we would like to present you an overview of a century of the disease. In 1922, a very young physician at the Children's Hospital in Zurich encountered a 60 year old boy presenting with severe anemia. This image represents the original drawing of the blood smear showing enlarged erythrocytes and some erythrocytes containing nuclear remnants. Additionally, the patient represents a very distinct clinic physical traits, including microophthalmia, the triangular face, and a sh short stature, hyperpigmentation, and this draw the physician's attention very much. Upon learning from the mother that she had previously lost a son, also due to anemia, the physician invited the entire family to the clinic. He subsequently identified another boy in the same family displaying the same peculiar phenotype. This has led to the publication in 1922, uh, 27 from Guido Fanconi, and that's the reason why we call our disease Fanconi anemia. Today, 100 years later, FA is not any more longer a childhood disease, and affected in individuals are no longer at risk of primarily dying due to anemia. Over 60% of all Fanconi anemia patients registered with the family uh, group in, Ge in Germany are over the age of 18. This is a huge advantage. Consequently, the disease profile has changed significantly. And today, we would like to provide you with an overview of these new developments. This remarkable transformation is the result of a global collaborative effort and which Wayne will talk about right now. Thanks, Wayne. So, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, the care of people with Fanconi anemia and our understanding of the biology has made very significant progress over the decades. There have been, um, so focusing on the blood related improvements, there have been very significant improvements in hematopoietic stem cell transplant outcomes. And um, Oenika is going to talk about this uh, later in uh, a, a section devoted to the clinical presentation of Fanconi anemia. The FA field, aha, uh -huh, this is not, <laughs> sorry. Um, there have been a number of firsts in the FA field, and not only firsts for the field, but also world firsts. And one of these is the first ever cord blood transplant. Um, and you can see the recipient here in a photo taken in around 2015, and he received his cord blood transplant in Paris in 1988. Another first was the first ever uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis with coupled with tissue type matching. And this was not just news for Fanconi anemia, but this made global headlines um, as far yeah, all around the world. And I think something that we don't talk about a lot, but is sort of the flow and effects that research that is done here, of course, it is ideally for the benefit of individuals with FA, but also for the broader community, uh, because it pushed forward ethical conversations about um, assisted reproductive technologies. Uh, also, regarding biology, there have been key advances in understanding the mechanisms behind bone marrow failure. Our first speaker, Meng Wang, is going to talk about this. And also, in the uh, late, in, sorry, in the 90s and in the early 2000s, there was a really nice period of gene discovery of the Fanconi genes where they were cloned. And in addition to that, um, there, along the way, during the gene discovery period, there was this connection made with cancer biology that's relevant to the, the general community. The discovery that BRCA1, BRCA2, and PALB2, when in biallelic loss of these genes, it causes Fanconi anemia. So this really brought forward the relevance of what's being done here to cancer biology uh, beyond. Also through a really strong understanding of the biology of Fanconi anemia biology, it's been possible to design rational clinical trials. And so through this careful experimentation using laboratory systems, 
Um, that has led into successful clinical trials. We're, we're going to hear about gene therapy trials um, later in the symp symposium. Uh, there are there's a clinical trial opening, which is the first targeted treatment for head and neck cancer in individuals with FA with a fat nib. Uh, you can go to the poster of Deborah Cavero Moreno for that uh, during the poster session. Also, we're going to be hearing about metformin and quercetin and those clinical trials. And there have also been advances in terms of seeing the real benefits of cancer screening in the blood and in the oral cavity. Uh, I, one thing that I also wanted to mention is that we um, we're not uh, we in these advances. Something that I haven't mentioned is that in our talk we don't devote as much time as we would like to today. We've had to make some tough choices, but we don't talk a lot about the psychosocial research, and this is something which is a blossoming field in the FA research community. And we just wanted to mention that up front, and we look forward to those sessions which are going to be in this meeting and a part of future meetings. So the <laughs> thank you. Um, so the first part of this talk is going to be Oinika giving a an overview of the clinical presentation of Fanconi anemia and the treatment options that exist. And then I'm going to talk to you about the molecular biology of Fanconi anemia. And we will finish with some open questions and hopefully we'll have some time left for discussion. Thank you, Wayne. Okay, moving, um, switching gears. Um, today, I would like to invite you to join me for a rather visual presentation than text slides. So please keep your eyes on these slides. Whether this is your first time at the symposium or uh, you are a well-known expert in the field, I encourage you to explore this disease from various perspectives and challenge what we think to know about the disease. Traditionally, the clinical hallmarks of FA are characterized by the classical trias of malformation, bone marrow failure, and cancer predisposition. However, we now recognize, for example, endocrine issues in FA are highly prevalent and perhaps in the past underappreciated. Additionally, we see a small, but growing number of individuals with Fanconi anemia associated neurological syndrome, which we are all also will address during this session. These clinical hallmarks are the key factors why our patients are being diagnosed. This slides illustrates the average age which these hallmark features typically manifest. You also can note that not all of the individuals display the same characteristics. The physical phenotype, which caught already Guido Fanconi's attention, is also something that has led in our days for the very first diagnosis of the disease. These acronyms are very crucial for the clinics because it catches what are the patients being diagnosed with. And if you have the, at least these three points, then you definitely should get test the patient for, for Fanconi anemia. Some physical features occur very frequently and that therefore they are considered to be typical for FA, while other features are unique and have been identified only in single patients. Actually, I would like to give credit for this and the following two slides to my great friend and uh, a talented dysmorphologist, Benilde Garcia de Teresa from Mexico. She is an expert in the field and someone I really deeply appreciate. By the way, if you ever go out with dysmorphologists, and we have some, in, some of them in the room, be prepared. They can spot rare diseases at each corner. <laughs> so as Wayne has said, um, there is a huge variability among these patients and uh, also something that we also face with the physical phenotype. However, you see here an example of a boy or a young man with no malformations and a young lady with the typical appearance. And the ones who are really expert in the field can see that this child is on growth hormones with the dysmorph is long legs, but a small torso. 
Now I would like to invite you for an important change in perspective in regards to malformations. At last year's symposium, we had two significant presentations highlighting that malformations carry a stigma and are highly associated with post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. This is an area we need to discover more. As said, not every patient looks the same. And this is crucial that we pay attention to this from the clinical perspective. This is the classical phenotype that has been described by Guido Fanconi. But as already said, it changed a lot, this Fanconi phase. We are now aware of the so-called downstream patients harboring variations in the cancer predisposition genes BRCA1 and 2 and PALP2. These patients do not present with bone marrow failure, but the typical Fanconi anemia malformation spectrum, but a very early cancer like kidney cancer and brain cancer. Luckily, we also have a growing number of FA adults and also a new diagnosis of FA adults in, uh, during adulthood. Those individuals typically present only with a very, very mild to logical uh, aspect and a bone marrow failure that does not need any treatment. Some of them are small, others are really looking nearly completely normal, but they have a very high elevated risk of cancer, which we will also cover during this year's symposium. Another observation is that the absence of different malformations is associated with an increased likelihood, a likelihood, not a risk, likelihood to become pregnant. So, and this is especially if you don't face any malformations in your genital tract, the likelihood of getting cancer in the FA population is higher. We tend to view malformations in a purely deterministic way. Once again, I would like to challenge you to shift the perspective and consider the dynamic aspects of malformations. I brought to you a point to two examples, siblings and monozygotic twins. Each one in the room can spot this out, that the hands look completely different, even being in the same family, harboring the same variant in the gene. There is a nice publication from 2001 studying um, the concordance of distinct Fanconi anemia phenotype. And the concordance between siblings is not so huge. It is uh, the microcephalus and renal malformation and a little bit the onset of bone marrow failure. But for the rest, that's it. Is this observation that siblings do not look the same and even monozygotic twins the consequence of stochastical effects? And when it is the stochastical e effect, why are these effects so characteristic for the disease? Something that we really need to think about from a new perspective. Okay, let's step this a step further. There's a significant clinical overlap between FA and something that we call fetal alcoholic syndrome. You can see here the hallmarks of two, the, the two diseases and to see that these patients really are a little bit overlapping in, on their malformation spectrum. In my view, this observation underscores the huge impact of aldehydes, not only on bone but also on the spectrum of malformations. Switching gears, we come to the part of the disease that gave the disease the name, the bone marrow failure. Fanconi anemia is one of the most common cause uh, of inherited bone marrow failure syndromes. These are characterized by every clinician knows that, the uh, distribution between mild, moderate, and severe. And in our population, the average age of developing these, these bone marrow failure is the age of 6.7 years of age. Guido Fanconi had no treatment for the bone marrow failure. Even trans blood transfusions was not available in those days. In our days, we have a growing and continue expanding 
options, even for bone marrow failure, and that's really fantastic to see. If patients are diagnosed with a mild bone marrow failure syndrome, in the past, we have done only watch and wait. And if a sibling donor was available, maybe also a bone marrow transplant. In our days, we are discussing gene therapy in this stage. However, if the disease is progressing, we have hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, medications, androgens, and L-thrombopac, and also gene therapy. We are very fortunate that today, in this room, we have at least 19 representatives from different countries. Yet, not every one of these countries has access to all these therapies. That's why I would like to take a moment to discuss with you androgen, topic that we so for, so for late not cover during this. Yes. Androgens. This is a, um, a biological rationale that, uh, based on the observation, that some of the Fanconi inhibitors uh, patients have uh, increasing counts during puberty or after puberty, and this is the biological rationale thing that we has been used in clinical practice and this cost efficient treatment has been applied to FA individuals already since a very long time. Here you can see derivatives that have been used over all these years. They are displayed by the declining androgenic, androgenic side effects. In our days we are using Danazol for the most. Androgens have advantages and they have risks. A clear advantage is that we know these drugs for many years. There are no acute uh, side effects and manageable and very well um, described um, um, side effects that we know that are clearly dose dependent and depending also on the length of the treatment. The risks, despite the side effects, are that they do not prevent the patients from uh, developing leukemia. And if patients are receiving these androgens and they need a bone marrow transplantation later on, they are older. If you have a, a treatment with no acute side effects, you can also say yes, and you also don't see an acute directly clinical aspect. So uh, this is uh, something that I would like to, to show you, an example of a Fanconi patient that was treated with uh, Danazol. And this is a wonderful response. You see um, that we uh, exposed the patient with five milligram per kilogram body weight. And the, uh, decline, the increase of the platelets is really dramatically. And you see also the red lineage, but also the, the white cells also go up. Um, as said, we also know that side effects are due to the dosage. We try to decrease dosage as soon as possible. And you can see here that the, this uh, dip was due to a viral infection, that this increase of uh, the counts and the stabilization continues. So you should treat if you use androgens as low as possible and as short as possible. And I brought you a picture of one of my favorite German Fanconi patients being treated with Danazo for more than 20 years, and you hardly can catch any genetic side effects in her. Um, we already talked about this bone marrow failure being age-dependent, and this is also true for other complications, hematological complications, mainly MDS and AML development. And this graph highlights the critical discovery made in this field. The amplification of chromosome 3 harboring EV1 is strongly associated with an increased risk of the development of MDS and AM. This observation uh, has saved many lives. So we now screen on these chromosomal changes and proceed with transplant before patients develop leukemia. I got details covering hematopoietic stem cell transplantation because this is a topic we will focus on Saturday afternoon. But I would like to give a brief historical overview showing how survival rates have dramatically improved over the last years. The most significant advantage was the introduction of ludorabine, especially for matched unrelated donors. You can see increasing survival rate from 30% up to over 50%. This is a huge increase. Also, uh, over the time, 
the donor uh, groups have been better treatment against viral infections and also uh, the avoidance of GVHD plays a crucial role in better survival. I could continue showing you graphs like this, but I would like to end that the survival rates for matched unrelated donors and matched sibling donors are now fantastic and very similar. And we are even applying in our days haplotransplant to our patients, something that we could not envision 15 years ago. This is really a great success story. This brings us to the next topic and why in my perspective, it is absolutely makes a lot of sense to change Fanconi Anemia Research Fund to FCF, Fanconi Anemia Cancer Foundation. I will not go into very much of detail because this um, cancer topic will be covered tomorrow morning, but I would like to highlight that this is the number one lethality reason for our population right now. And if we want to continue to improve life expectancy, we have to work on this together. I would like to give Ray Monat the credit for a very important sentence. Panconi anemia is not a pan-cancer predisposition syndrome. You don't get cancer all over the body. You get cancer at the, you can get cancer at very typical locations, what we know, squamous cell carcinoma, especially of the head and neck, the esophagus and the anogenital region. At the MDS and the leukemia, we already covered. And for the downstream patients, harboring uh, variants in BRCA1 and 2, or PALP2, the kidney and the brain. And we now learn with a growing number of FA adults that also breast and liver cancers are more frequent. Still, we need to get more data to find out if this is a really pure elevated risk and therefore it's so important that all of you take part of the friends so that we can get this information all over the world and that this is not an information that is being lost somewhere. I will now show you a busy slide. This slide represents nine Fanconi anemia individuals and it want, I want to show you with this slide something that is very crucial for our population. Head and neck cancer is not something that you fight once in FA. It's an ongoing process. They can occur early in life or maybe later. And patients who have undergone hematopoietic stem cell transplantation still are at significant higher risk for developing these cancers. This might be due that they are the population with a more severe phenotype. However, there are also examples in this slide with cancer-free time, like this boy here and this boy here. What have these patients done that they have been able to prevent relapses? And once again, I would like to encourage you to change your perspective. And when looking at these graphs, it is a very important message. You can live with cancer. And early detection is crucial. And furthermore, I'd like to quote an adult with FA who is also uh, among us today. Because looking at this graph could mean also that we all run out of the room right now. But he says, says I don't live my life as if it's my last day on earth. Instead, I live it as it would be the first day of a new life to begin. Treatment options for Fanconi anemia patients with cancer is a challenge. Surgery is still the most important treatment option. Radiation should not be withheld from individuals who need it. However, standard alkylating drugs should be avoided. Immunotherapies are very promising and it is not, especially because they are not genotoxic. The FA virtual tumor board is a great resource and a huge opportunity that no physician should miss to discuss clinical cases with experts from the field to identify the best treatment options for those patients. And of course, early detection and screening contributes both to an increase in quality of life and quantity. By the way, talking about quality of life, we moving GS, moving to endocrine issues. These endocrine issues are something that we may have missed over the last years. 
I would like to recall last year's symposium when we had Sebastian Lacour Rasmussen on stage. He's also here today. And you can find him because he's already all, again wearing this very <laughs> sitting in here. And um, um, Sebastian was talking about a life before and after the administration of hydrocortisone. He summed it up perfectly with a quote from the movie The Marktrix I got the clarity of mind. While significant progresses have been made in understanding female, female fertility, and I already showed you some example of this, there's still relatively little knowledge about male fertility. And we could spend an hour on talking about uh, issues on these uh, slides. Furthermore, a common question, for example, is why are our individuals often smaller in size, even if their growth hormone levels are normal? Why is being underweight a typical feature of the disease? Today, we also have very important lectures about metabolics, nutritional sensing, and the impact of diet. Fanconinemia associated neurological syndrome is a very devastating complication that we yet need to fully understand and are still unfortunately far away from knowing how to effectively treat them. The clinical presentation is a loss of neurological capabilities and a hardly regain of them. Also, the vision is impacted. On the radiological findings, we see these large uh, uh, lesions in the white metal area and also calcifications, especially in the brainstem and in the cerebellum. On histopathological examination, we see microvasculopathy here uh, um, with a blocked, uh, blocked uh, vessel and hyalization on the vessel wall. And this is a very, very interesting finding because it's hardly seen in any other disease. At this time, I would like to invite again um, my <laughs> colleague in crime on the field, Wayne, to continue with the biological background. Thank you, Anika, for this very nice um, overview of the clinical presentation. And of course, the clinical presentation is what um, this, in addition to the psych psychosocial component, this is what really matters to patients and what affects them. But it's also very important that we understand the fundamentals of the biology, which is what we're going to talk about now for uh, the next 10 or 20 minutes, so that we can uh, do you know, rational clinical trials to improve outcomes. So Fanconi anemia is a chromosomal instability condition, and it's caused by a deficiency in DNA interstrand crosslink repair, which I'm going to talk about more. Uh, the, this genetic pathway, it protects against uh, external sources of DNA damage, but also internal sources of DNA damage. And I think that you can appreciate from this image here, um, where they... Um, the cross-linking drug called diapoxybutane, which is used in a diagnostic test, it's applied to cells and when people with Fanconi anemia, uh, when someone has Fanconi anemia, there's an increase in chromosomal aberrations and very specific types of aberrations. Uh, there are gaps in chromosomes, breaks, and multivalence. And these are the sorts of things that can be detected by... Um, uh, expert sided geneticists. And I also think that something that you can appreciate from this image is, so Oinika made the comment about alkylating agents need to be avoided in treatment of people with FA. Uh, you can appreciate from this image, from the amount of damage done to the chromosomes by these cross-linking drugs, which are alkylating agents, how devastating it would be to the, the chromosomes of an individual. So that is a one hallmark of cells from someone with FA. And another hallmark is this extreme hypersensitivity to DNA cross-linking drugs. So the last image, that was a cytogenetic view of things. And this is looking at cell survival. So this, this graph that I have taken from the first paper, which um, discovered the first ever Fanconi gene, which was FANC-C in 1992, you can see the cells in um, this line here. These cells from this individual with FA, they die at much lower concentrations of 
uh, diapoxybutane compared to the experimental conditions where they put back FANC C. And so this is a really huge difference. This is a log 10 scale on the x-axis. So that means um, a really big difference in the amount of that drug can be tolerated by cells which have a proficient FA pathway. Another hallmark of um, cells from people with Fanconi anemia is a G2M arrest. So that's that means a cell cycle arrest. If we just start here on the top left, these are cells from a person who doesn't have Fanconi anemia. And what we're looking at is a flow cytometry plot where you can see the G1 um, phase of the cell cycle, and this is G2. Also, I want to mention that um, if using a lot of jargon in this, this is being recorded. Um, so this I think might be on YouTube later, yeah. or it's going to be it's going to be available somewhere. So if there's too much jargon, you don't need to look it up now. You can, you're welcome to just listen and um, look at it again later. So the cells here are cycling cells from a person who doesn't have Fanconi anemia. Here, mitomycin C is applied to those cells. This is another alkylating agent, and there's not a lot of difference that you can see between with and without that drug. But there is a really extreme difference in what you see in the cells of a person with Fanconi anemia. And so what this is showing is that these cells, they get blocked uh, around the stages of where replication is occurring in the cell cycle. And then the other thing that it shows also is that there is an active checkpoint in these cells. If you are here, um, you appreciate already that Fanconi anemia is a very rare genetic condition, but I'm just going to go over a little bit more detail about that. So it's um, the carrier frequencies uh, vary around the world depending on the population and on the study, but they range from this roughly one in 64 to one in 180. And the, that number, the one in 180, if you use that, that's how you get to the approximate in incidence of one in 130,000 individuals. Of course, this is a, a range, but it's, it's helpful, I think. The inheritance of Fanconi anemia is autosomal recessive. So that means that in almost all cases, the parents of someone with FA, they are obligate carriers. Uh, there are exceptions to this. There is the X-linked um, Fank B, which means that only males are affected with respect to this gene. And there is also a very rare dominant um, subtype where RAD51 is affected, which is sometimes also called Fank R. There are at least 22 genes which have been implicated directly in causing Fanconi anemia when they are not functioning uh, ordinarily, and they're part of a common DNA repair mechanism. And so these are all of the FANC genes that have been published to date with cases uh, where individuals have had Fanconi anemia and um, biallelic or homozygous mutations in these genes. And what you can see by ranking them by frequency is that by far FANC A is the one which is most commonly affected. Uh, the majority of FA patients in um, all the cohort studies to the best of my knowledge. And then followed by FANC C and FANC G, then uh, often FANC-D2 is one of the more frequent, albeit infrequent, if that makes sense. And then after that, it becomes very rare subtypes. Even if these subtypes are very rare, uh, it doesn't mean that they're not critically important. Every one of them is prevents Fanconi anemia, um, and they play critical roles in the biology of uh, the DNA repair that we're talking about. I also put some other genes in this graphic just to make the point that there are other genes that we know work in this DNA repair pathway in concert with all of these other genes, but no individuals with clinical Fanconi anemia have been described to date. We will hear about one of them, in fact, 100 in this meeting, uh, and also there have been patients with ADH5 and ALDH2 um, mutations that had FA-like conditions. And, you know, this goes to the point Onika was talking about with the intersection of fetal alcohol syndrome and FA. Uh, something that I thought is worth mentioning is that um, what about the carriers of um, people with who have one Fanconi gene affected? So this is uh, typically the, the parents of people with FA. And there is not that there's only strong reproducible evidence to, for BRCA1, BRCA2, and PALB2. There is not very strong reproducible evidence um, for the other genes playing a role in suppressing cancer 
uh, in the general population, or at least not to the extent that these genes do for breast and ovarian cancer and some other types. <clears throat> so exactly what this um, Fanconi and sometimes called FA BRCA pathway is doing is repairing DNA interstrand crosslinks. So very briefly, DNA is a double-stranded molecule generally, which is held together by weak hydrogen bonds. And these can be unzipped by helicases, which is, this is a, a drawing of helicases here. Um, so th the DNA can be unzipped for replication or for other um, cellular processes, but what happens when they get to this interstrand crosslink, which is some, it's different from the way DNA is normally held together. It's, this is what's called a covalent crosslink and generally the replicative helicases have problems bypassing this lesion. So in order to, um, to prevent the chromosomes breaking at the next cell cycle, this crosslink needs to be resolved. Uh, this is a figure that I have taken from the FA clinical guidelines, which was made by Agata Smogoshiska, and um, this has more detail. This is basically showing the same thing as the last slide, um, but with a lot of granularity with respect to the genes that we know about. And if I appreciate that for many people, this is a lot of detail that um, is too much. The, the main thing is that there's an interstrand crosslink that stops replication of DNA, which really needs to be resolved. And the goal is to get from there down to here to allowing replication to proceed to make two double-stranded DNA molecules at the end of it. Um, but for those who do know a bit about the, the genes involved in the FA pathway and want to know more, what we spend a lot of time thinking about are some of these down upstream and downstream parts of the pathway that Oinika referred to before. And here there is this thing which we refer to as the Fanconi anemia core complex. And what this is, is it's one big E3 ubiquitin ligase and its job, as best we understand it, is to transfer a single ubiquitin molecule onto a heterodimer of something called Fank D2 and Fank I. And what that does is it causes that structure to clamp onto the DNA, uh, onto double-stranded DNA adjacent to the site of the lesion, and it won't let go until it's deubiquitinated by some key enzymes. And you'll hear a lot of talk about this FANC D2 and FANC I monoubiquitination during um, some of the more molecular biology focused sessions. And the reason that this is important, well, one of them is that it's just, it's necessary to progress through this DNA repair pathway to, um, to repair the DNA. And so what it specifically is needed for is to create dual incisions on either side of the lesion. Uh, to unhook that and to allow translesion synthesis to then fill in the missing information and homologous recombination machinery resolves these DNA uh, repair intermediates. And interstrand crosslink repair is the best known function of the genes from the FA pathway. And many, there's been the work of many laboratories to decipher what's going on here. And this is some of the state of the art today. But in addition to that, we also know about um, that these genes and their gene products play important roles in other related DNA repair mechanisms, such as R-loop metabolism, fork protection, and others that um, we won't go into in the interest of time, but that these have been established as well. Uh, just one more thing about Fank D2 ubiquitination, and then we'll move on from that, is that, so we have this sort of like upstream part of the pathway where the genes here are required for monoubiquitination of FANC D2. I wanted to show you an example of this. So this is what's called a Western blot where scientists can look at proteins. On, um, they can look at proteins. It's a way to visualize them. And what we can see here is FANC D2. And there's this slightly larger version of it, um, which is eight kilodaltons larger, which is the ubiquinated form of that that runs slower on a gel. And you can see that in the non-FA cells that you have this happening. You can see in cells from someone who has um, biallelic mutations in FANC A that they don't have FANC D2 monoubiquitination. However, in this patient with mutations in Rev7, which is a downstream part of the pathway, they still have proficient monoubiquitination. And so this is a generalization, but it's sort of like 
how many um, scientists sort of think about this pathway and sort of the stepwise progression of it. And I highlight it because it's relevant in the context of the patients. Um, Oenike talked about the variable presentations based on certain things that can be linked to the genetics, they can be linked to other things, but the upstream part of this pathway is what Oenike was referring to as the classic phenotype of FA and this, you know, stronger predisposition for bone marrow failure, whereas the downstream, uh, in the case of many individuals who have pathogenic variants in downstream parts of the pathway, there is less of a tendency for bone marrow failure compared to up here and also a different cancer spectrum. So where exactly do these DNA crosslinks come from that um, we keep talking about? Well, there was a really um, important advance made about 13 years ago, uh, published by many key papers that came out of the group in particular of KJ Patel, which is showing that it's aldehydes that are the endogenous source of DNA crosslinks that lead to bone marrow failure. And this was shown you know, very elegantly in studies using mice. Um, and what you can see here, this is a there are like different, this is plotting survival over time of mice with different genetic uh, genotypes. And you can see there's this one that stands out. And these mice, they die of severe aplastic anemia, which is um, comparable in a mouse sense to bone marrow failure in humans. And so it had been a, a question for a long time why mice don't get bone marrow failure to the same extent that people do with disrupted Fanconi genes, even though these genes are doing the same things at the cellular level as what's happening in humans. And so this was a real revelation that alcohol detoxification is playing a really important part of that in mice. And then this was shown a couple of years later to be relevant, very relevant to humans. There was a Japanese study which showed that because there's a high frequency of alcohol dehydrogenase 2 um, mutations in Southeast Asia, they were able to look in a cohort of FA patients where they had either two copies of ALDH two working or one or none. And you could see that what they saw was very similar to this, that the onset of bone marrow failure was much earlier in people who are, who have Fanconi anemia and who have um, less copies of functional ALDH2. And this has led to this idea of a two tiers of protection model where in, with respect to um, aldehydes that can come from endogenous metabolism, alcohol, tobacco, that ADH5 and ALDH2, um, that is, th these are two enzymes that are key in the detoxification of reactive aldehydes in us. And then if that is to fail in that some crosslinks are formed from those aldehydes, then the FA, repa FA DNA repair pathway is a backup for that. And so if both of those things don't manage to repair an interstrand crosslink from reactive aldehydes, that's how you can get chromosomal aberrations that have very real clinical consequences. And just like it was very important to understand the biology behind bone marrow failure in people with FA, we're now faced with this really big challenge of understanding the biology of head and neck cancer in FA. It's, it really is not clear exactly um, what is driving head and neck cancer in individuals with FA at such a high level, but studies like this are really helpful to get to that point. And so what this um, study from Agata's group has shown, there's a number of key things that came out of this. Um, first of all, on the right is that um, the head and neck cancers from individuals with FA, these were all HPV negative. And so they did a comparison with sporadic head and neck cancers from TCGA data, and they used the HPV negative cancers to make the comparison um, because of this observation about HPV status. And so here there is a really big summary of a genomic deep dive into looking at the, the landscape of what head and neck cancers look like from individuals with FA and comparing them to these sporadic head and neck cancers. And I think there's there's lots of things that come out of this, and we're going to hear more about it during the symposium. But some of them are that, uh, in addition to the HPV status, is that P53 is mutated in almost all of these cancers. And this is not necessarily the case with what is seen in hematological malignancies. So there's already a difference there. 
Uh, also, there are many driver genes from different pathways. I don't expect anyone to um, read all of these, but they are lots of different pathways. And this will be really useful for researchers to think about when they're designing their mouse models to make them as relevant as possible to humans um, when they're making mouse head and neck cancer models. Also, I hope that you can appreciate that there's a lot of orange and gray on this side of the plot compared to this one with the general population head and neck cancers. And so these represent uh, copy number changes, amplifications and deletions. And so another difference between the FA um, head and neck cancers and the general population is that copy number is what drives a lot of um, these tumors as opposed to point mutations in these cancers. Um, in, the, in here, we also see that the epidermal growth factor receptor is one of the genes that's amplified. And this is the target of a fatinib, which is the drug being used in the head and neck cancer clinical trial. So that also supports the idea that there could be other drug targets in here for head and neck cancer. And so having talked about a lot of this biology, I think now is an okay time to bring in um, just a little bit of an overview about how FA is diagnosed and what the tests are, having this context of the biology of Fanconi anemia. So the, um, <clears throat> the gold standard for Fanconi anemia is the chromosome breakage test. And this is really like, this is something which is very special to this field. There are a lot of genetic diseases that don't have functional tests and I can't stress how good it is to have this, to be able to really decipher in a, um, I know it's not as easy as always saying yes, no, because it can be very hard to make these diagnoses, but it is an absolute asset to the field to be used to its full potential. And so the way that this chromosome breakage test works is that um, often increasing doses of a cross-linking drug is applied to cells to look for a dose-dependent increase in chromosomal aberrations. And this is something which is really specific for Fanconi anemia, the types of aberrations that you can see and that are in a dose-dependent um, way. There are also other tests that are useful, but a, a lot of these, um, they are non-specific or have other sort of caveats, but they are incredibly useful nevertheless to have in the toolkit. So the micronucleus assay is something that helps to detect broken chromosomes that um, can get transmitted into daughter cells. So this is a very powerful assay, um, but it's not specific for FA, just as the G2M phase arrest is also very powerful, but not specific for Fanconi anemia, but still helps um, complement diagnostics and also research. There's the FANC-D2 Western blot, which I spoke about, and you can also use it in immu immunofluorescence to look at FANC-D2 foci. This is useful for helping to try and potentially get some information about where in the pathway a patient who has FA might have their mutations. And then there is comp genetic complementation analysis, which is incredibly powerful to be able to assign causality to pathogenic variants. And that only comes from having uh, a functional assay as well. And so these um, four assays here, they tend to exist more in research settings. They can be diagnostic, but they tend to be in research labs. And the chromosome breakage test tends to fit very well into cytogenetics diagnostic laboratories because it uses the skill sets of cytogeneticists. And then something which is part um, these days of a diagnostic cascade often in places where you have the luxury of being able to do this is to identify the, identify the pathogenic variants that are causing Fanconi anemia. Uh, and the reasons for doing this are multiple. So one is that if you can identify which subgroup uh, or which gene is mutated, um, this can be really useful for appropriate cancer screening, depending on which group the patient fits in. Uh, also, it's important for being able to test siblings and for family planning, both for maybe for the family that has just had a child with FA and wants to have more children, and also for when these people grow up and would like to start families of their own. This is very useful information to have. Also, it's important to know which gene is affected in an individual's case for being able to do gene therapy. You have to know which gene is affected to be able to do gene therapy. Um, and in terms of the techniques that can be used to identify 
the variants. There are probably not too many surprises, but you know, so there are the high throughput sequencing based methods like gene panels, exome and genome, but there are other more traditional methods that still very much have their place such as targeted sequencing, where maybe you already have information about a mutation in the family and um, microarrays are still very much used to help detect copy number changes. All right, so the last um, two things that are interrelated that I want to talk about before we wrap this up is somatic mosaicism and also its link to gene therapy. Um, so somatic mosaicism is something which occurs in 10 to 25% of cases of FA. It is a genetic reversion event that occurs in a hematopoietic stem cell. And the reason that it, this is so prevalent is because it can provide a proliferative advantage to effectively correct the mutation. So these blood stem cells can then start to proliferate. And um, the, the challenge though, is that what then happens is that if you were to, in, in these cases, when you do chromosome breakage on blood from someone who has mosaicism is that the test can be equivocal uh, and in rare cases it can also be negative for Fanconi anemia. Um, but the reason that it would be equivocal is because you can see two populations of cells and just advancing one point. So, but then if you do a chromosome breakage test using skin fibroblasts from this person who very much has Fanconi anemia and can be seen with a fibroblast chromosome breakage test, but looks equivocal in the blood. Um, this can be something which is making diagnosis more challenging. And I just thought it was very helpful to show this plot, which I really like from a paper from the group of Jordi Soreyes. So these red dots over here, these are from patients who are known to not have mosaicism. And so on, you can see along this axis that a high proportion of their cells have chromosomal aberrations, but then they have information about these patients and they know that this these patients here represented by blue dots they know that they have mosaicism and so you can see that there's 10 to 40 percent of their cells have aberrations as opposed to a much higher percentage here um, so what this is showing you is that there are these two groups of cells in the peripheral blood of these patients and the reason that understanding this is so important, there's you know, two major reasons. So the first, first of all, is that it's important to be able to get the diagnosis right for FA. But another one is that you know, doing these detailed natural history studies like this one and many others that have been done by the field, many people in this room, is that understanding this well has led to the rationale for doing gene therapy for the blood, uh, for the hematopoietic system. And so the last thing that I want to show you uh, about the somatic mosaicism is the first paper that I could find about understanding the molecular mechanism behind how this works, because I think it's a really nice illustration of the, the problem. So here you have an individual with FA and their peripheral blood has, they've done a chromosome breakage test with no mitomycin C. And then as we go down, there are increasing doses. And you can see that the number of breaks per cell goes from almost none to almost, well, like more than 10. So really extreme difference at these different ends of the concentration range. And then you see in the individual who doesn't have FA that as you have the increasing doses of this drug, you don't see um, any, hardly any chromosomal aberrations still. Then 13 years later, so this study is done from in 1982. 13 years later, they repeated this chromosome breakage test on the same individual. And if you just sort of pass your eyes down here and you look and you say, which of these two things does it look like? It really looks much more like the individual, that the profile of a person who doesn't have Fanconi anemia. And so this shows how there really is this proliferative advantage of the cells that um, that have a restored Fanconi anemia DNA repair pathway. And the so the molecular part of this, which I think is absolutely mind blowing that they were able to do this, um, was they showed that in the fibroblasts that are sensitive to mitomycin C from this person, they could see that the Fank C mutations in this person were in trans. And then they took resistant clones of lymphoblasts from this person. And they showed now that these mutations in the resistant clones were in cis, and which also infers that there's a functional copy that might have been restored on the other uh, homologue. 
And so this was the first evidence of how um, somatic mosaicism can occur at a molecular level. And there are other ways that this can happen. There are very good reviews that summarize this, uh, and as well as primary research. And so fast forwarding uh, into a much more present time, there is this work that has been published in 2019 by the CMAC group with, um, led by Paula Rio and Juan Guerin. You can see here on this plot, the leukocyte counts going down of an individual who was a participant in this trial. And what they did was they took um, hematopoietic stem cells from these from the blood of these people. They transduced it with a FANC A lentivirus because they were all FANC A individuals. I don't know why this keeps happening. Um, so they transduced with with a FANC A um, in a lentivirus, and you can see relatively rapid engraftment that just keeps going for the two and a half years that they tracked these patients before publishing this work. And you can see that for the four patients in this study, the same pattern was observed. And then you can see down here for the same individuals um, that there are clones in the bone marrow that are resistant to mitomycin C showing the, the functional reversion thanks to um, putting FANC A back in. Okay, so this brings us to the end of the um, the, the biology section of the talk. And just before we close out this introductory talk, I'd like to say that there has been so much research into FA and it has been really growing exponentially over recent decades. It's been very hard to summarize everything. So I apologize that due to the lack of time, um, we things were left out, but thank you to everyone for all of the research that you do. And I'm going to hand you back to Oinika to um, talk about some open questions. Thank you, Wayne. So uh, we would like now to wrap up our introductory lecture. And I, again, would like to challenge you with a shift of perspective and would like to invite you to see Fanconi anemia as a segmental premature aging syndrome. From all what we have heard today uh, and what we know from us as well, we all have to age. Maybe expect Wayne and me. <laughs> we don't age. <laughs> So, um, but when we look at our patients and what we also see on the molecular basis, we see typically age-related diseases already in young patients, bone marrow failure, MDS, leukemia, and squamous cell carcinoma. So we can say that Fanconi anemia is a time-lapse of these diseases. For those of you with FA, please don't run out of the room because this view on the disease opens up a completely new world of potentially prevention options. So in the future, we have to study this and we can piggyback what we has been learned from the general population because uh, every one of us, and this is observed by us, is, age in, is aging in a different way. So we know that lifestyle choices and especially physical activity has huge impact on the aging process. Also, we now learn in the context of nutrigenomics that it's not only important what we eat, but also how much we eat and when we eat. And we will also have a talk on this today. Moreover, the environment, the exposome, how you live, what's your social interactions, have a huge effect on what is the stress reduction on you. So we are in a wonderful setting here and uh, we can all have good social interactions. This sounds a little bit awkward maybe, but we can measure these effects in our days on the cellular level. And this is due to the wide range of genomic testing availabilities, especially on epigenetic changes, but also in the modulation of the immune competence. I mean, like the immune system is the, the system that keeps us alive. So, and we can study these effects, how much the immune system can act. We also learned now our increasing knowledge, what is the content of our gut microbiome also in the interaction between those two. So taking everything important together, all of this, what we already heard today is important for us, but it's especially critical for our fragile population. Therefore, we would like to end with a quote from a Fanconi anemia individual who is unfortunately not longer anymore with us. We all have only one life to live. Let's use this opportunity. Thank you. <laughs>